The name Nikolai Polikarpov seems to be an integral part of the Soviet Air Force. He was an aviation engineer who'd left his footprint in the aircraft industry, both in the Soviet Union and worldwide. However, this modest, hardworking, scrupulous, and deeply religious man had a tough and sadly very short life. Polikarpov studied at the St. Petersburg Polytechnic Institute and began working in aviation even before the Russian Revolution of 1917. His true genius spread its wings under the Soviet regime, when the fledgling Soviet aircraft industry skipped through the copying stage. It was Polikarpov who insisted that the USSR needed to build its own designs instead of copying or modifying older Western models. And he made good on his words with his deeds. In 1927, Nikolai Polikarpov developed the U-2, a multi-role trainer aircraft, which was Soviet through and through, from blueprints and sketches to engines and flying devices. Also known as the PO-2, this aircraft outlived its creator and stayed in service even after humanity broke the sound barrier. Besides, the U-2 later joined the top five most numerous aircraft in history. The list of official modifications alone exceeds any reasonable length. The Bolsheviks, however, expressed their gratitude in the expected way. In 1929, they arrested the engineer and his team and sentenced them to capital punishment. However, the authorities warned Polikarpov and his colleagues that they were going to spare them as long as they stayed useful, and ordered a new fighter for the Soviet Air Force. Their work resulted in the I-5, a plane whose success was literally the deciding factor between life and death for Polikarpov. The I-5 lay the grounds for an entire family of great biplane fighters, the I-15, that took part in the 1930s conflicts in Spain and China. Fortunately, this feat brought Nikolai a pardon that replaced capital punishment with a 10-year suspended sentence. Even after the entire ordeal, Polikarpov continued working for his country's defense industry. In 1934, the skies saw the first Soviet monoplane fighter, the I-16. It became a true symbol of contemporary Soviet aviation at the time. That plane was the backbone of Soviet aviation in the early days of the Second World War and endured a long path of upgrades. While the first I-16 had a 480-horsepower engine and only two PV-1 machine guns, the latest modifications had 1,000 horsepower, 20mm Schwach cannons, and rapid-firing Schkuss MGs. Sometimes, they even had the large-caliber UB machine guns. In the late 1930s, it wasn't that obvious how big an advantage monoplanes had over biplanes, so Polikarpov kept working on the I-15. So, in 1938, Soviet aviation received its last biplane fighter, the I-153. It was a deeply modernized version of the I-15 with retractable landing gear and, on some models, cannons. It already felt like an outdated concept at the time, but the war soon proved that the decision to make it was correct. Capable of taking off from a tiny forest clearing, the I-153 could deliver unexpected, precise strikes on ground targets and intercept enemy planes when paired with faster monoplanes. fighter aircraft were growing quickly, and Polikarpov knew that he had to start working on a new model as soon as the I-16 hit mass production. His I-17 project with an inline liquid-cooled M100 engine was discarded, but the I-180 with a radial 14-cylinder M88 engine managed to get to the trial stage. And then a tragedy happened. The prototype engine failed during the tests, and the I-180 crashed, taking the lives of two test pilots, Valery Chkalov and Thomas Suzy. And again, this led to arrests, guilt, fear, and the torture of waiting for a reprisal. A small number of the I-180 was eventually produced, but it never became popular. Still, the work had to go on. The army needed an even better machine. Polikarpov developed the I-200 with a strong AM-35 engine, but before he could finish, the authorities seized the project from him along with most of his team and gave it to Mikoyan and Gurevich. The latter had to complete the project on their own. Although it was named the MiG-3, we could very well say it's a Polikarpov machine. 
much like the later prop-powered MiG interceptors based on the MiG-3. It was certainly unfair, but Polikarpov didn't let it defeat him and continued working. Right before the war, he developed the TIS, a twin-engined multi-role fighter, which was a continuation of his earlier VIT project. It never passed the prototype stage, but if the competition had failed the trials, it would have had all the chances. Right after that, a new prototype of the I-185 was made, with an 18-cylinder M71 engine. But that engine became just another problem. It took too much time to fix its flaws, essentially burying plans for mass production once the war began. Four prototypes were built during the evacuation of 1942. Two had M71 engines, and two had the 14-cylinder M82. The prototypes passed all the tests and actually made it to the front lines. But the war had already begun, and trying to organize production of completely new machines was out of the question, especially when it might hurt the established lines. The situation was further complicated by the backstage moods of the Soviet political and military leadership. They either plainly disliked Polikarpov for his religious beliefs, or envied his talent. The ITP project that took off in 1941 shared the fate of the I-185 and never reached mass production. It also became Polikarpov's last machine. Extreme stress, exhausting work, and a hungry life in evacuation took the last bit of health he had. Nikolai was never used to complaining about his well-being or aches, so when he was finally diagnosed, it was too late. On the 30th of July, 1944, the legendary engineer passed away. It was the end of an era. But after that, a new one began. Because Polycarp of students and heirs still live by his example and keep on laboring in the aircraft industry. Music